All right, I'm Jim Mundorf, and this is Lonesome Lands Podcast, and today we're talking to Bill Bullard about how cattle ranchers are now going to be forced to use electronic identification ear tags in all their cattle. And so last Friday, USDA announced um, their rule that would um, force cattle ranchers to use electronic identification ear tags in specific kinds of cattle. And the reasoning behind USDA, or what USDA said the reason behind this rule is, is for disease traceability. It would make disease, it would make it them easier and faster to trace diseases in cattle. And so I read through the rule, and what I was surprised to find is that this rule does virtually nothing to increase um, disease traceability. Um, what the rule actually does is simply require animals um, 18 months of age or older that are sexually intact, meaning bulls with testicles and females that haven't been spayed or are able to carry a cow or able to carry a calf. Um, those animals will be required to have an electronic identification ear tag in their ear if they cross state lines. Right now, those same animals are required to have a USDA-approved ear tag if they cross state lines. So the only difference is the kind of tag that these animals will be required to have in their ear. And the difference as far as disease traceability goes is that if one of these animals comes down with a disease that needs to be tracked, um, it would be able to be read, the ear tag would be able to be read by passing a wand electronic wand uh, reader near the ear tag and that would then put the number on a computer the difference from what is happening now is human eyes are reading a number off of an ear tag and putting that onto a computer and that's really the only difference that this rule makes and so i think what a lot of people would say is who cares what's the big deal um and the answer to that would be the USDA. That's who cares. That's who has made a very big deal about getting this passed. They put in a lot of work. They're forcing taxpayers to pay for the tags, um, and they want this to be passed, which then leads to the next question, which is why. And the answer to that is incrementalism. Um, freedom is very rarely lost all at once. It, freedom is taken very in small increments at a time. And the smaller the increment, the less resistance they find. Um, and USDA knows that ranchers and cattle producers don't want this mandate. Many ranchers who already use the EID tags still don't want the mandate. Um, and so the goal for the USDA is for those cattle producers who are very against this rule, once it's, once it's implemented, they say, well, that wasn't so bad. Right. Um, and what everyone needs to remember is the end goal. And the end goal, which USDA has made clear, is to have these EID tags in every animal and to have the, the information on those tags mandated, um, meaning source verification and vaccination records, which increases value for the multinational beef packers that control the industry and that control USDA, but also um, the greenhouse gas emissions or, or like a carbon score. That information will be required on the ear tag because right now what the USDA has said that their main goal for all of agriculture is MMRV, Measure, Monitor, Report, Verify. Um, and that greenhouse gas emissions, they want all of agriculture to be able to do those things. And the number one tool for getting the cattle industry to be able to measure, monitor, report, and verify their greenhouse gas emissions is electronic ID ear tags. And so what you need to remember when you look at this rule that seems to do virtually nothing, that is a very small change, is that what this rule actually is, is the beginning of the end of freedom for the American cattle rancher. All right, so you can watch the podcast on YouTube or listen on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find the podcast. And if you'd like to support what we're doing here, go to lonesomelands.com, click on subscribe at the top of the page, 
or on your phone. If you're on your phone, click on the three bars at the top of the page and click subscribe and you'll find a number of different options there of ways to, to support what we're doing. Here is Bill Bullard. We have Bill Bullard with us. Um, and so if you're not familiar with Bill, I, I told him he can just tell us who he is and what he does. Um, so go ahead, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Jim. So I'm Bill Bullard and I represent RCAF USA. I'm the CEO and we're an organization that exclusively represents cattle farmers and ranchers and sheep producers in the multi-segmented beef supply chain and sheep supply chain. And so we represent only the farmers and ranchers. We're the largest trade association in the United States that exclusively produce, or excuse me, exclusively represents the producers. All right. And you are, you're from, where are you from? Um, I, I'm from South Dakota. Oh, okay. And you live in Montana now, right? Billings, Montana. Billings, Montana, right, Montana now. right now. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. And so when I was, when I was looking at this deal, I thought, well, the person to talk to was the person I feel like who's probably researched it the most. You've been into this deal, this electronic ID tag or RFID is what it used to be called um, for 20 years now, right? You started fighting this thing and what year you said oh two started in 2002 yes yeah so 22 years now um and you guys have have stopped it up until this point and now we have a new rule coming in and so i guess what the rule is do you want to explain that just kind of give a give a breakdown of what the new rule is um so, yes, so the, the new rule applies to adult cattle over 18 months of age that are sexually intact, that are shipped across state lines, and it also includes bison. And what it requires is that for those animals shipped across state lines, uh, they must be affixed with an electronic identification ear tag. Uh, it isn't good enough to have just a, a, an official USDA ear tag anymore. Now it must be an official uh, USDA ear tag that is both uh, visually readable as well as electronically readable. So this is a, a mandate for the exclusive use of uh, uh, electronic identification for those adult cattle that are crossing state lines. Now, all dairy cattle are also required uh, to be affixed with uh, electronic identification um, as well as uh, rodeo stock and other livestock. But the, the main emphasis is on um, adult beef cattle that um, are shipped across state lines. Yeah, and so it's a change, what they, they actually just called it an amendment, right? Or they're just updating their old rule because is that what it said at the top? I thought that's what it said. There's an update to the rule of, you know, just in, instead of a USDA tag, it has to be an electronic. USDA tag, right? That's what they right. say. Right. And, and I view this as not an update, but rather reneging on the promise that they made in 2013 to independent cattle producers, uh, when at the time the USDA promised them they would have flexibility because they really didn't need the electronic component in order to achieve improvements in disease traceback. Right. And uh, that's what the industry thought ever since 2013 until January of last year when they propose this uh, mandatory EID rule. Yeah, and so I guess we'll get into that. Um, I mean, you know the history. That's that's why we're having you on, because you know the history, I think, is as good or better than anybody. Um, and, and so their reason is traceability, right, and disease prevention. And I thought it was interesting, um, if you read their press release, USDA's press release, they actually got into what this means for trade. And that's something you've always talked about. Um, and what what do you think about that? Their their press release and and what they said about the trade policy, how they included that in there. So this was originally um, all about trade. After the United States entered the World Trade Organization in 1995, uh, there have been recommendations from the international organizations. Um, that were in, encouraging nations to adopt a uh, a formal and a regulations-based animal identification system. And the purpose of which was to facilitate trade, was to encourage more 
uh, imports and exports. And of course, uh, the reason that it would facilitate trade is because of the disease traceability component. But the emphasis was on um, increasing um, imports and exports around the world. And so that's why this started soon after we entered the uh, World Trade Organization in 1995. And actually, uh, the beginnings of this effort to uh, impose a national animal identification system started actually in 1999. And then it, it came to the forefront in 2002 during the discussions of uh, the implementation or of mandatory country of origin labeling. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, th I thought we'd go through this rule and then we can kind of get into the history of how you okay. how you've kind of stopped it in the past. But feel free to go back to that stuff. Um, but on this rule, so we talked about breeding stock, and it, it seems like after reading it, I was like, this is they're wanting to get their toe in the door on this thing. And then after reading, it, it's like they almost just want to get their pinky toenail in the door. Almost, you know, it's kind of like they they really shaved it down to 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 see if they could get it to stick. I think um, that's what it seemed like after reading it because it's just breeding stock um, over eighteen months of age, and there's all kinds of different provisions in there. Like if you're heading direct to slaughter, it said not subject. Right. Um, right. So, so if you're hauling a coal cow to a slaughter plant across state lines, you don't have to tag it, right? Um, and then that's what the rule says. Yes, if it goes directly to slaughter. What about sale barn? Like, if like our coal cows go to the sale barn, um, will sale barns have to tag them if they? I mean, so although if if, the, I guess if you're going to a sale barn, if it's going, I guess if a packer buys it at the sale barn, then they wouldn't have to tag it. But if somebody else buys it, then they have to tag it, right? That's, that's right. That works. So okay. where it goes after it departs the sale barn uh, would mm -hmm. would be the determinant of whether or not it's required to to bear a, yeah. the ID tag. Right. Yeah. And that's what. What do you make of that? Just because to me, breeding stock, I don't understand how that's going to really slow down traceability as far as um, disease prevention, because breeding stock for us, when we you know, the goal with raising breeding stock is you keep it on your place until it does go to the packer. You know, we are right. our hope for heifers is to have them for 10 years or whatever and bulls to have, if we keep bulls to have them for a while. Um, and so really the amount of animals moving across state lines, I would say breeding stock is, I guess there's all those bull sales and stuff, but as far as numbers of animals crossing state lines, breeding stock's probably the the smallest number. Well, and and that would depend on the state that you live in. Like if yeah. uh, using Ohio for an example, there's no slaughtering plants in Ohio. So anyone that has cull cows that they uh, needed to um, sell, that they would go out of state. And, and that would be true in other regions and states where there are no packing facilities. And in fact, this is somewhat discriminatory because it would impose a cost on those who do have to ship cattle across state lines, um, but those who who live in a state where you have two or three packing plants, they they would not be even subject to this rule. And, and your point is well taken, and I think the the reason behind it is absolutely right. And that is, uh, this rule represents a, an effort by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, to divide the industry's opposition. Uh, to their effort to eventually, and in not too distant future, require all cattle of all ages to be electronically identified um, beginning at birth. And that's their ultimate goal. They reference that throughout uh, the rule that uh, this is a starting point. Um, and, and, and to provide an example that was uh, argued, if you will, during the comment period, is that USDA estimates that only 11 million cattle would be subject to this rule, and that's out of a herd size of nearly 100 million head. And USDA in the past has stated emphatically that they needed at least 70% of the cattle to be identified electronically in order to have a meaningful um, effect on their ability to conduct disease tracebacks. And so their response to that argument was, well, they really didn't mean that it wouldn't be helpful. Uh, and even just the 10 or 11% of the cattle would, would be helpful, uh, but it is not going to allow them to accomplish their objective 
of having um, disease trace back under whatever time frame they believe is necessary. And so the ultimate objective here is that the, this rule is intended uh, to have less opposition than would a full rule, but their goal is the full rule. This is phase one, right. phase one of a mandatory animal identification system using electronic identification. Yeah, and to me, the, the thought behind, you know, because I don't trust anything that they're saying, which I did find it interesting that they did put it, like that was in their, their report there that they talked about the 70% um, mm -hmm. is what they needed. But I also think um, when you think about breeding stock, the guys that are, they're getting guys, the guys that are half breeding stock are the guys that are raising the, the brand new calves. And the goal is to get a brand new calf as soon as it's born to get tagged. So if you get the guys who are raising breeding stock used to using these tags, then what's the difference if they just have to put it in every single calf they're born, you know, they're used to using them. Um, but one thing I found really interesting and I've, you know, I'm kind of been watching what people have been saying a little bit and, and there seems to be a lot of questions and misinformation out there. Is there any data that is supposed to be on these tags? Like you just have to tab the tag in the ear from what I've read. Right. And so they're not requiring any data at all, which to me, it doesn't, that makes even less sense. Um, I mean, because, and they talked about these assisted, what do they call them? Approved tagging sites. Mm -hmm. Were you familiar? Like, what is that about? Like, are, are ranchers able to tag their own calves if they're going to do it? Or why was there so much talk about these approved tagging sites in that? Well, my understanding of that is they, they needed a um, identifiable location where animals that would be uh, leaving the state and going through that location could be tagged that weren't already tagged. And so the data that's included on these tags at this point in time would be that the tags would be associated with the number uh, applied um, that's also on the tag. And it would be that number that would be in a database that would be associated with the premises uh, from which the animal um, exited. And so if, the, if it were tagged on the farmer ranch, then uh, the premises would be the farmer ranch. If it were tagged at an approved uh, tagging site, my understanding is that would be the premises uh, that would be associated with the tag number. Right, and to me, that doesn't, for traceability, I don't know how that's going to speed things up that much. Um, because really they talked about, are, how are they going to distribute these? Because they have, so that's the other thing. Um, if you're not familiar in the latest omnibus, $15 million was put in there. NCBA came out as soon as this rule was passed and said that they were very proud of all the hard work they did to, to make taxpayers pay for this thing. Um, and so $15 million have been allocated to pay for these tags. And you just said 11 million cattle are going to, that's their, so $15 million doesn't pay for that because they're talking, um, I mean, depending on how many tags you buy at a time, I think it's, what is it like five bucks? Is that kind of going to be the average per tag or? Well, they're, I think they're estimating somewhere around $3 and 50 cents a tag. Oh, really? So it's less than, I think I'm going off of that 2017 report right um that's where they had it so maybe yeah so you probably read something up more updated but yeah but even at three dollars fifty cents for 11 million that's uh yes yeah, so, so what is really um important for disease traceback would be the accompanying uh interstate certificate of veterinary inspection the icv right. and and those two would be associated with the tag number on the cow and so they would, the distrib distribution of the tags would be to the sites um, that are writing the ICVIs for interstate shipment, and they would have the tags available. And I, I presume that USDA is going to provide tags uh, to those sites. And they also give a number that producers can call to obtain their own tags. Um, and USDA makes it clear that uh, you know, in order to overcome the the concern that this was an unfunded mandate that they were imposing a cost a production cost on an industry that has suffered from the uh, inability to even achieve its cost of production from the marketplace for years up until we were struck by this drought 
that uh, shrunk our supply so tight that the latent forces of competition, you know, began to drive our cattle prices up. Uh, before that, prices were seriously depressed. And, uh, and so we argued that USDA was imposing a, an untenable production cost on producers with no promise, no expectation of receiving any um, recovery of those costs in the marketplace itself. And the way USDA overcame that was <laughs> they, they got the, the lobbyists of the organizations that represent Packers to lobby Congress for a $50 million allocation this year uh, to buy tax. And, uh, and so that was the, the means by which they overcame the argument that this was an unfunded mandate but they make it clear that they can't promise to do that year after year because that's uh, contingent upon Congress appropriating money year after year. Uh, but they have a historic track record. Since 2004, Congress has appropriated over $150 million uh, for this effort by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to eventually get to where they are now and then take the next step, and that is to uh, mandate the exclusive use of electronic identification ear tags to the greatest extent possible. And that's your objective. Yeah. Yeah. And so for, to go back to kind of the tracking thing, um, cause to me, I'm thinking about, okay, so they have these USDA tags that are in cattle now. Right. Um, and so the difference in tracking it is you'd be able to read it with a scanner, but then you still have to go back. The only difference really in this EID tag and reading one off the cow after reading all, through all this stuff, I thought the only difference, because there's no information mandated on the tag, which I assume is coming. Like, I mean, that's always the, what I've always talked about is the, their first mandate, the tags, then they're going to mandate the information. But right now it's only where the tag comes from, not even where the animal comes from. Um, originally, because I was thinking about like somebody buys replacement heifer there, 12 months old, you know, and that goes to a different state. And then somebody breeds that heifer and they sell it as a bred heifer. And that could go to a different state, you know, and th at that point is probably when it would be tagged, you know, that's when it's over 18 months, but then it could mm -hmm. continue to, you know, have that same tag in and you would never really know the origination. Right. I mean, well, the requirement as I understand it right now is that for the per purchase of these electronic identification ear tags, you would provide your premises location. Um, okay. And so that information uh, would be associated with the number on the tag uh, as that animal travels from state to state, for example. Yeah. Which is similar to what we have now with readable tags, right? Well, with readable tags, um, you, you've got a number associated with a an address. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, so it's, it's important to understand that what they eventually want is they want to record all movement. Right. And they want to re record movements from one premises to another, even within a state eventually. Yeah. And, and I think so, that goes to kind of showing like, this is not an ends to any sort of mean, this is like a beginning. This is, this is the toe in the door because exactly. there really isn't that much point to having this rule after I read it, because like the difference is, well, you can read the tag with a reader instead of reading the tag with your eyeballs and writing the number down, right? I mean, that's the difference mm -hmm. in this rule. And how much time is that saving, right? I mean, to me, there just doesn't seem to be any point at all to having these tags. So it, what, Or the rule, I guess. Yeah, so, so their argument is, is that with an electronic identification um, tag and the, the reader that can read the tag, there is less chance for error of, of making mistakes when writing the number down because they're long numbers. And they say the electronic identification system with a reader uh, will alleviate the, the, the potential human error in, in writing the numbers down. However, um, they make these require these tags to be visually readable so that those who do not have a electronic right. wand uh, can write the number down. So um, th their argument is is really thin um, because, as said earlier, uh, this is not going to be a, a boost to their ability to conduct disease tracebacks. In fact, when they issued the proposed rule, they made it clear 
that the, the weakness in the system was the fact that all of the company paperwork was not required to be digital, digitalized. Um, and as a result, you know, they were still working with handwritten uh, lists and handwritten ICVIs. Um, and, uh, and they said that the greatest improvement that was made since the 2013 final rule was in the education and improvements made in converting the paperwork into electronic um, data that could be uh, managed on a computer. So, um, you know, this all leads us back to what you said. This is merely an effort to get their foot in the door because eventually what they want is for all cattle to be uh, identified electronically from birth till slaughter. Right, yeah, and that's... It's wild to me after reading through that, and I just did this morning, and I was like, well, there is just really no point. I mean, as far as this rule goes, and it, it just really kind of makes the point clear that this is the beginning of That's right. <laughs> of, That's right. of more and more mandates. Yeah. Um, and you talk about, um, you know, some people will talk about, well, it makes it, you can read it so much easier, and you don't have to catch, you know, how far do these readers work? Do you know? I heard, I heard like three to five feet they got to be within. Yeah, there's. I, I think that's about right. I think in the proposed rule, and I hadn't looked at that for a while, I think there was like 30 some inches um, <laughs> that they needed to that's be read by. Close. And I was yeah. thinking too, like, well, that, you know, that works. I've heard of feedlots and stuff. They'll have them mounted in their alleyways and stuff. But if you have a sick cow, which it goes back to what their point of their thing is traceability. You're not running it down the alleyway and letting it back out into the pasture. You know, if you have a sick cow, you're catching it. And if you right. have to figure out what kind of disease it has, you're drawing blood and doing all kinds of stuff um, and hopefully treating it. Um, and so that's really the difference is reading a tag with your eyeballs and writing the number down with reading it with a reader. But you were talking about those, the ICVI, which is Interstate Veterinary Certificate of Inter Veterinary Inspection. Yeah. Right. And those are now all digital because in the thing, it, it almost seemed like they were just paper. It kept referring to it as documents in the rule. Right. And so there's, there is no requirement that they become digital. Um, <laughs> but what the agency has done is tried to encourage the industry to, to begin uh, transferring the information to a digital format, electronic format. And they right. made some headway there. Uh, and, and that's pretty important because that means that if there's an incentive um, through education or through economic means uh, for producers to, to do this type of um, EID requirement, then many producers will voluntarily do so, uh, particularly those who are receiving an economic premium from the marketplace for participating in such a program. Um, but, the, but the agency is uh, <laughs> essentially picking at the low-hanging fruit Mm -hmm. uh, rather than go after the, the, the veterinarians who are filling out um, the ICVIs, they're going after the cattle producers first who are have the least resources um, to resist it. Mm -hmm. And they're imposing these strict uh, requirements upon the cattle producer within the even the live cattle supply chain. Okay. Um, a lot of the the report, I guess, or the rule, the actual text of the rule was responding to comments. Is that typical that they go through and they're like, one commenter said this, and this yeah. is our response. I found that to be pretty odd. Well, actually it's it's a requirement. Oh, so okay. when the an agency like USDA uh, proposes rules and solicits public comment, they have a duty then to respond to all the important comments made. If they fail to do that, then the age, the, then the rule itself is subject to litigation on the grounds that the, that the rule was arbitrary and capricious because the government failed to respond uh, to known uh, concerns raised by the public. And so it's commonplace in the rulemaking process that in the final rule, the agency will select what it viewed to be all the important comments okay. and would respond to them. And, and <laughs> many times all they say is, we disagree. We're, yeah. Uh, well, I guess that not. shows what I know. I mean, I, that's again, that's why we have you on. You've read all kinds of this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, reading through it, it was just kind of like good grief. And it's the pay the I've checked the actual rule or the paperwork is 106 pages. 
So, you know, I was just kind of skimming through. I I haven't gotten through. Have you read the whole thing or? I, I've skimmed through yeah. the whole thing. I <laughs> yeah. haven't read it extremely you, close. Yet. Like, could you find, I'm sure RCAF had pretty detailed comments. Um, did you find their response to, to everything that you were saying? Well, so one particular comment that we uh, included was that we, we told the agency that it was un-American for them to require U.S. cattle producers to purchase the chips uh, from China, which, uh, of course, is under the control of the uh, Communist Pro uh, Party of China. And so we sent a letter in the rule making process as, during the comment period asking the Secretary of Agriculture to inform us as to whether or not the eight or so companies that were uh, certified as official uh, manufacturers of EID tags, whether or not those eight companies were actually obtaining the computer chip from China. And we got no response to our letter. But in the uh, responses that the agency gave within the final rule, they essentially just argued that we meet our federal procurement requirements and we follow the Buy American Act uh, requirements. But they did not disclose uh, the actual origins of the chips that are included. And we made the, the comment that this could be a national security issue. In fact, it was during the pendency of this uh, public comment period that the Chinese balloon was shot down <laughs> after it crossed mm -hmm. a bunch of, of the northern sector of, of the United States. And we said, you know, this would provide opportunity for surveillance of where the food is uh, in the United States. And or how the, much we agency, have, yeah. Yeah, and the agency's response was, we didn't provide um, evidence that this was a national security problem. Yeah, so they don't have to really give real answers, but they are supposed to respond, I guess. And one of the things I didn't, you know, like I said, I was just skimming through and I'm sure I don't remember exactly what my com comments were, but I'm I'm pretty sure I probably included like the loss of freedom, loss of independence. Um, I know Shad uh, has brought up property rights. He, he called right. it a property right issue, which I think opened some people's eyes. And when you think of, like I have said before, when you think of property rights, a lot of people just think of their land or you know, but this is, you yeah. know, for cattle ranchers, their property is their cattle. And and when you are mandating them to hook something onto their cattle, um, that's a loss of property rights. You you are losing your right to to raise those the way you want and, and do what you want with those things. Right. Were there any comments or were there any responses to anything like that? Was there ever a talk of of the loss of independence or freedom or property rights in, in the responses to any of those that, that you saw? Jim, I, I don't recall. Um, I, I don't recall offhand if I saw responses to those arguments. Yeah. And that's, it, that's what kind of made me, I was looking through and then I, did you see any, I saw one that said, um, one commenter talked about how the electromagnetic field from RFID tags would, would damage their, the, or damaging to humans or animals. And, and they said there is no, known evidence to electromagnetic fields um i thought that was kind of like did, i don't know what did you think about that one did you see that or have you heard of that um I, i've i've heard that argument before mm -hmm. and uh you know we're dealing with uh, an unknown um, right th these tags have not been in existence uh they're continually updated uh, the technology is changing, so we really don't know what the full potential is of these chips in a cow's ear, whether they could be used for surveillance, uh, whether whether they would emit the <laughs> electromagnetic right. fields, uh, don't know. Yeah, um, and it is your food, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's something to think about. But yeah, I thought I found that one to be kind of funny. I was wondering who who commented that one, but wasn't um, us. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder if you how much of that how how wild you get if you can really go through every single one of those because there was a, like I said it's almost 106 pages and almost all of it is response to comments right um, right and yeah so um, what else I have here um so I guess to go back we've kind of covered what's going on now. And I suppose before we get into um, your plans or RCAP's plans, as far as the rule goes, to go back um, a little bit, like I said, you've been fighting this for 22 years. Um, I think it's important too, to talk about that 2017 report, which we got into a little bit, but, um, and I'm betting you have those numbers off 
the top of your head what they found in that 2017 report of how fast they can actually trace readable tags. Um, do you have that information? You know, I, I don't. Um, okay. But what we do know is that, you know, when the uh, Canadian cow with the BSE was detected in Mabton, Washington, back in late 2003, a uh, traceback was conducted. And uh, the agency was able to trace back using brands and uh, bangs tag numbers. And we've had, um, you know, tuberculosis has been constantly reintroduced in the United States through the Mexican border. And the government has been able to trace back uh, those animals. And so our position has always been that the greatest risk to foreign animal disease to the U.S. cattle herd is through imports. And so what the agency should be doing is bolstering our import protections by reinstituting uh, the import restrictions we used to have, but no longer have. Uh, and, and this is part and parcel to the USDA's plan. What they would rather do is to have open borders and then put the um, responsibility on the part of the industry to manage these foreign animal diseases after they enter the United States. And uh, they can't argue that this isn't the case because they have been relaxing import restrictions for many years. Uh, we used to prohibit uh, importation from any country that had BSE or from it, countries that had foot and mouth disease. And the uh, United States is, has relaxed our standards and now is trying to carve out regions within an, a disease affected country and claiming that the, the disease is, is localized in one area and all the rest of the country is free of the disease and can continue to export to the United States. These are high risk um, policies that the USDA has adopted. And as a result of the high risk policies, they, they needed to have some improvements on, on the ability to do, do the disease traceback. And they found it in the um, this national animal identification system effort that as you said, has been uh, they've been pushing for over 22 years. Yeah. And so I went on here. Um, I, I took my, okay, I'm still on there. Um, so this is their announcement and going back into what you said, it says by being able to readily prove disease-free status in non-affected regions of the United States, we'll be able to request foreign trading partners recognize disease-free regions or zones instead of cutting off trade for the entire country. And so that to me reads, um, we can't ask for disease-free status unless we can prove our own. Is that kind of what you were talking about there? Um, and every time I hear foreign trading partners in the beef industry, I just think of Brazil. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, and, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago, what was it 2018 that they were, that they got reinstated to import beef from. Right. So, they were, they were caught shipping, um, ramps that beat uh, in right. the export market. And the United States was one of the last countries to close its borders to that uh, Brazilian product and finally did so. Um, it was first discovered in 2017. And so this is an example that uh, the USDA is not looking out for the interests of the producer. It's looking out to, for the interests of the importers and exporters. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note that only 11% of uh, the beef produced in the United States last year was exported. And that means uh, about 89, 90% of all the beef produced in the United States stays in the United States and is consumed here. And so this emphasis on export markets um, uh, really inures to the benefit of the multinational beef packers. And that's who USDA is catering to. And that's who benefits uh, from this imposition, economic imposition on uh, cattle producers, is that uh, the multinational meat packers would have, um, you know, unlimited, unrestricted access uh, to our product to ship elsewhere and for uh, products in other countries to be shipped here. Yeah. And then it goes back to how much sense does it really make? Because I mean, how many breeding animals over 18 months of age are getting exported? You know, I mean, they're <laughs> so it's like if we do have a, you know, this, this, it just goes back to prove that this is the starting point. Um, yeah. So we have members that are voluntarily using EID ear tags right now, and they're using them because they're participating in uh, the European Union's um, uh, no antibiotics. 
uh, requirements mm -hmm. and they're able to prove it through that process and they go out and hire a third party verifier, but they're getting a premium in the marketplace for doing it. And so now that the government is imposing this uh, burden upon all producers, uh, those premiums will eventually evaporate because why would the meatpacker continue to, to pay a premium uh, for a value added effort that is now required of all cattle producers? So eventually that's where we're headed. Right. Is that those who are taking advantage and, and have the opportunity to be involved in a legitimate export program, um, th their profits are going to be shrunk as a result of this. Yeah, and I, I, we've talked a lot about this is the starting point, but maybe we should talk about the ending point is when, you know, source verification and, and all of those things that they need um, th that bring premiums, verif um, vaccination records, all of those kind of things that bring premium, like what you said, those people involved in those programs, it brings them premium prices. Um, that goes away once all that is eventually, that is the ending point is one that so all the, right. all the cattle are wearing these tags and all that information is mandated. And I've talked a lot about how now we have all these, we're, we're getting into all these regulations on um, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this would be the easiest way to regulate that also. Right. Um, That's right. But I know, you know, this is, that's kind of the new thing. And like we go back 20 years, you've been doing this and you talked a little bit about the start of it, but the most recent, um, I guess, how did you like go into maybe the, the last time they tried this RFID tag, it, it was kind of, it was one of your lawsuits that, that stopped it. Is that correct? Or? So, yeah. So what had happened is, um, Quick history, uh, it, right. 2002 is when mandatory country of origin labeling for beef was passed by Congress. And th the meat packers objected to that. And so they they said, well, in order to have a uh, country of origin labeling procedure, you have to have a national animal identification system. So they tried to include in the country of origin labeling law a requirement that a national animal identification system would be used to make origin declarations. Congress objected. And in fact, today's language for mandatory country of origin labeling includes the prohibition for the use of a mandatory identification system for determining the origins of covered commodities. And at the time it was beef, and of course beef has now uh, been uh, removed from that requirement, but the, the law remains. And so that was 2002. And then uh, 2004, uh, Secretary, then Secretary of Agriculture Ann Vindman announced that as a result of the BSE outbreak that was occurring in, in Canada, that uh, the United States would move forward with a national animal identification system known as NAIS or N-A-I-S. And so there was a concerted effort. And that's when Congress started pouring money uh, into this effort to, to force producers uh, to comply. And what happened was, is that the uh, independent cattle producers objected strenuously to this uh, proposal on the grounds that it was an infringement on their freedoms and liberties and independence, and it was an effort simply to control the industry. And what was interesting was, um, as they continued to pour money into this, they tried to encourage producers around the country to voluntarily register their premises. So that was a starting point uh, for this NAIS program. And uh, what they found was that in the hog industry, for example, which is now vertically integrated, you know, we wiped out nine out of every 10 hog producers in the past four decades. And so with uh, this vertically integrated industry, 80% of the hog farms agreed to the premises registration, weren't concerned about the, the infringement on their freedoms and liberties. And 95% of the other uh, industry that's completely vertically integrated, that's the poultry industry. But in the cattle industry, only 18% of the cattle operations uh, voluntarily participated in this. And, uh, and, and, and that was a huge disappointment, caused Congress to retract uh, the ongoing funding that it was provided to this program because the industry simply objected to it. And that's then uh, what caused USDA starting in 2010 to back off, to back off the cattle industry and start looking for alternatives and that's eventually how we arrived at the 2013 final rule that said cattle producers could use a variety of different uh, identification devices. They could use metal ear tags, plastic ear tags, 
with a USDA official shield on them, uh, or they could use brands, tattoos, um, and group lot identification. So producers had the ability to choose what worked best for their operations. And we didn't object to that. We objected to the proposal, but once it was finalized, um, this was a, a, minimal, a minimal encumbrance on the, on the part of producers. And USDA promised at the time, and even said during that final rule process, that the animal health officials in charge of conducting disease tracebacks endorsed the flexibility rule. And so that was a promise to U.S. cattle producers that, that this is as far as we were going. And then suddenly, um, the Secretary of Agriculture in 2019 simply issued a notice and said that by January 1 of 2023, uh, the only identification device allowable would be the radio frequency identification tag, RFID. That was in early 2019. And around mid-2019, we filed a lawsuit alleging that the Secretary of Agriculture had no authority uh, to mandate the, uh, the exclusive use of an RFID tag, and they did not follow the rulemaking process. And like within three weeks of our filing the lawsuit, USDA withdrew their mandate. And, uh, and then they, they, try, they came back again. Uh, they tried to do it not through a formal rulemaking process, but they, in about 2020, they tried to do it through a notice procedure. And we pushed back again and won. And USDA again backed off. And so this is uh, just yet another iteration. And it demonstrates that, uh, uh, that the government's deep pockets are hard to overcome. And as you said, we've been at this for over two decades. We've held them at bay until just very recently. And it's because even when you win, they simply regroup and come back at, it, at you again with from a different angle. And the angle they're at now is, as we talked about earlier, is they pared this down to where it would simply, it's actually ineffective in achieving the objectives that they said uh, were, were a part of this, this rule process. Yeah. And to, to go back to that voluntary, I want... I think in that 2017 report, you were talking about the, the different kinds of tags that can be used and read and used for traceability. I was pretty sure they said 50% of states could trace back using those that voluntary tags of your choice. Um, they could trace 50% of states could trace back within an hour, uh, the animal. So if they had a disease outbreak, 50%. And yep. so do you know of anything like to me, that would be like, well, how do you bring the other 50% up? to the, you know, and, and I think the rest of the states or the majority of them was within, I don't know, three, four hours, something like that. Right, right. And so how do you increase that? And, and uh, I mean, do you know if anything was done about like just increasing the traceability of readable tags or was it all, you know, everything's just been one big long drawn out push for electronic ID. Is that pretty it's much the latter? This yeah. has been one long drawn out push for a while there, they one of their goals was a 48-hour traceback period they were attempting to, to achieve under the National Animal Identification System. Uh, they found that that would be um, unattainable. And uh, and so th there's been, uh, it's ebbed and flowed. Uh, you know, they make statements and they get pushed back and then they come back with the, a new approach, a new argument. Uh, so it's been kind of like... Um, nailing jelly to a tree, as I've heard. Uh, <laughs> they're hard to pin down. and uh, But ultimately, it, it, it goes back to what we began with. Uh, this is just an effort on the part of USDA to get their foot in the door so that they can soon uh, require a full-blown national animal identification system for the entire industry. Yeah. And you talked about how they, they didn't when you stopped them that time, they didn't use the correct rulemaking. Can you tell, like reading through this rule, can you tell that they're kind of making, crossing their T's and dotting their I's and, and they know that, exactly. that something's coming probably. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so what is coming, I guess I should say, um, what is RCAF's plans? Um, or well, to, to so, so the rule was just issued. Um, and, and we're still reading the rule. Uh, and if I've made any mistakes today, I'll try to let you know and correct them mm -hmm. uh, because we're still analyzing it. And uh, But we know already that we are um, strenuously opposed to the government's efforts to mandate a specific type of technology for our industry. 
And so we're opposed to the rules. So we're talking to members of Congress right now about using the Congressional Review Act that allows for a congressional resolution of disapproval for an agency's rules mm -hmm. and could potentially overturn those rules. Now, that effort is underway right now, uh, led by Senators John Tester, Democrat from Montana, and Senator Mike Rounds, Republican from South Dakota. They've introduced a resolution of disapproval for the agency's previous rule to allow fresh beef from Paraguay. And it passed the Senate uh, by an overwhelming margin, something like 70 to 20. And now we're awaiting the scheduling in, in the House. But the effect of that resolution of disapproval would be to overturn the rule, that the rule would have no force or effect, uh, no legal force or effect, and the agency uh, could not um, resurrect it. And so this is what we're looking at right now for the EID rule is the potential resolution of disapproval. Also looking at legislation that would prohibit the secretary from mandating any particular type of animal identification device. Um, and, and that's gonna be our, our first um, effort would be through Congress. And if that fails, then we will continue to look at the potential for litigation. Our members are adamant that the government has no authority uh, to impose this kind of a mandate upon the industry um, under existing statute. And, and again, we view this as an infringement of uh, the, the independence, freedoms, and liberties of uh, cattle producers, as it is, in fact, an encumbrance upon their property rights. All right. Um, so what do you think about, I've been, um, I've been, there's a lot of talk on Twitter. I talked to Shad this morning. He said, I think it was Adam Jones put a poll up on Twitter, which it's a Twitter poll. So, you know, but I think there was close to 700 people responded. And I think 70% of them said they will refuse to use the tag. What do you think about um, people just saying that? Like, I'm not doing it. Um, and what is that going to lead to? Um, should producers do that? So I'll respond to that in the same way that we have members who are so um, opposed to the current beef checkoff program, they, they've asked us, should we just quit paying? And the answer is, then you're subject to liability. You're subject yeah. to fines. I thought the we same recommend thing. that you do that. Um, that there will likely be fines under, not under the, the, the rule, but the agency already has uh, enforcement mechanisms uh, for animal disease purposes. And I'm sure this rule would fall under those. So we would not recommend that producers do that. Um, but we would recommend that producers continue to object strenuously to their members of Congress and urge their members of Congress to take action to stop the overreach by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we're, um, it, the other important thing is, is that uh, this rule will go into effect six months after publication in the Federal Register. And I haven't had a chance yet even to look to see if it's been published in the Federal Register yet. We saw an advanced copy of the rule that was issued uh, earlier. And so we've got a six month time frame uh, within which to overturn this. And so there, there isn't, uh, there, is, there won't be a necessity for a producer who is just so adamantly opposed to this that they will not comply uh, we've got some time between now and then uh, to to change this so that they don't have to be put in that position. Right. Yeah. I thought the same thing about the checkoff. We've I've heard all the horror stories. I mean, there's been guys who said we're not paying. I think some guys even put it into another account so they had it there, and, right, right. and they got fined out of business pretty much that's or, right. or close that's to right. it. Um, and so that's that's the federal government. That's what they're. <laughs> if you tell them you're not going to do something, they're going to. They're going to make you pay. Um, so our position is we must use every legal and ethical means uh, available to overturn this rule. And that's our goal. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you don't, like if none of this works, I, I, I guess I was going to say, as you've talked about that rule for disapproval, I guess if people are calling their Congress people, their senators, um, write that down. Say we want a rule of disapproval for a resolution of disapproval. resolution of resolution disapproval, of disapproval for the EID rule. Um, Correct. Yeah, that's something they could. And if they're reaching out, that'd be a good thing to say. Um, but if this goes through and and this mandate becomes law, 
Um, what do you think the USDA's next step would be? Because it's obvious that this is the first step. Um, and and how how soon do you think that would happen? The next logical step uh, that could happen within a matter of a couple of years would be uh, a proposed rule to require all feeder cattle uh, to be uh, electronically identified uh, when shipped across state lines. Because I think, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture first thought it could impose this uh, on the industry within the states. It thought it had intrastate jurisdiction. It later uh, acknowledged that it had interstate jurisdiction through the Commerce Clause, uh, but not intrastate jurisdiction, which is why uh, this uh, imposition for cattle crossing state lines. It's because that's where the USDA is asserting its authority, and it's not certain and probably doesn't it knows it doesn't have authority within the states. And so the the next logical phase would be uh, the requirement for all feeder cattle shipped across state lines to be electronically identified. Yeah. And so that, you know, for somebody like us, our feeder cattle go to Dunlop, which is, I don't know, 40, 50 miles, probably at the most from Nebraska and one of the biggest cattle feeding areas in the country, which is Northeast Nebraska. Um, and so, yeah, that would, you know, place, places like us and, and anyone, you know, a lot of feeder cattle go across state lines, I guess right. is what I'm trying to right. say. Um, and so before I let you go, are, are you, are you pressed for time or, nope. um, okay. Um, there's rumors about a farm bill, um, within the next couple of weeks. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd pick your brain a little bit on that. Do you think there'll be a farm bill in the next couple of weeks? And, and what do you think will, will be in it? So actually today, uh, there's been announcements of both the House and the Senate having the, their original draft farm bills uh, for public dissemination. And so I've looked briefly uh, at what the Senate version is. I haven't looked at the House version yet, but we can be assured that the, the multinational meatpackers and their meatpacking lobby uh, will make certain that none of the meaningful reforms will be included in these base versions of the farm bill. So we're not going to see the restoration of mandatory country of origin labeling. We're not going to see any effort uh, to prohibit, you know, beef from uh, fresh beef from countries that uh, where foot and mouth disease remains endemic. Uh, we're not going to see reforms of the beef checkoff program in these base versions. We're going to have to fight to get them in because uh, Congress is has been following the dictates of the multinational meatpacking lobby. And, and and despite the fact that that producers have been dropping like flies, the last census showed us that just in the last five years, we've lost another 107,000 uh, independent beef cattle operations in the United States, just in a seven year or five year period. And so we go back to just over a generation from 1980. So more than five out of every 10 cattle producers in business in 1980 are gone today. And Congress still doesn't understand that this is a threat to our national food security, uh, that we have to maintain a widely disaggregated, widely dispersed production system in the United States uh, in order to withstand economic shocks like a COVID pandemic, like bird flu, like uh, a natural climatic disaster. Um, we're headed in the wrong direction and, and Congress just doesn't get it yet. Yeah, and that's... That's what I think every time I hear those kind of numbers, it's like US, USDA has failed. USDA has failed American agriculture. Um, yeah. When you hear about 100,000, 107,000, you know, especially the beef industry and, and the farmers too. Um, every every sector of agriculture is is becoming more and more concentrated, less and less independent right. producers. And right. that is that is just a pure and simple failure of US Department of Agriculture. I mean- it seems now like their goal is is to keep pushing that because they're doing the same thing and and they're speeding it up. So, um, thanks a lot. I guess do you have anything else you wanna you wanna say you wanna promote our calf? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> or where where they can find you or find more more about. Yes. Yeah, so our ability to achieve the uh, desires and goals of independent producers is based on how large we are, because that's the first question Congress asks us is how many producers do you represent? And so for those of you who want to change, uh, I would encourage you to join. 
And you can go to our website at r c a l f u s a dot com. You can go to our Facebook page. Um, you can go to uh, you can call, do it the old fashioned way, call on the phone, 406 252 2516. The larger we are in terms of the number of producers we re represent, the more effective we'll be in achieving the reforms that are needed in order to restore the opportunity for profitability back to independent cattle producers. Yes, thank you. And I wanted to, I've, I talk a lot about all this climate smart and climate change legislation coming on. And I was talking about failure for the USDA, but I mean, RCAF is one of the few, um, maybe the only really ag um, association that is pushing back. And and I know I've had Brett on and I know he's really gung-ho against pushing back against all this climate stuff. Right. And, and, you know, if you look at Farm Bureau, you look at all of the you know, American Farm Bureau, the national one for sure. And and a lot of the other ag associations, they're all on board with this deal. And so if you really want, if you want to find a, a an ag association that that is pushing back on that climate stuff, um, our calf, I guess, is the and one. And one of the reasons we can do that and the others can't is because we are exclusively dependent on membership dues and contributions for our budget. We don't, we don't receive any corporate contributions. We don't get any checkoff dollars. Uh, we represent the producers and we're beholden to nobody else. Right. Yeah. Which makes it hard. But <laughs> I was reading, like I said, I read NCBA's response to um, to their to that EID thing. And you go on their website and every time there's a big advertisement for, you know, John Deere or or something, sure. United Airlines, they had a big advertisement. So, I mean, that's that's who they're that's who's paying their bills, really. And then they kind of pretend to pretend to 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 represent their members but anyway you're here to talk about RCAF we don't need to talk about NCBA and thanks for coming on and and thanks for keeping people informed and keeping me informed um we'll I'm sure we'll talk down the road convention I'll be at your convention uh yes June, June 19th 19th and 21 yep okay yeah so Deadwood Deadwood South Dakota it'll be a good time and I'll see you there sounds great thank you Jim thank you all right. Thanks everybody for watching and listening and who've shared the videos in the past and, and helped this channel kind of and podcast to grow and keep growing. Um, if you'd like to support the podcast again, you can go to lonesomelands.com, click on subscribe at the top of the page, or if you're on your phone, click on the three bars at the top and then click subscribe and you'll find some different options there of how to support us rate review all that stuff um if you're on youtube subscribe and like um anyway i think that's all you have to do but main thing share it um share the podcast if you like what you hear and you think there's good information there um share it with your friends to help help keep this thing growing and stay tuned <laughs>